and connected together by a paper mache adhesive. And so when they turn this on its side and lay it in the roadway, it simply looks like a portion of the curb. But in reality, it is an explosive device to be detonated when the sender sends a signal to this cellular telephone. Next slide, please. So that's it when it's laying on its side on a street in Baghdad. I mean, essentially undetectable, which just increases the sense of risk you have no matter where you are or where you're going. Next. This is a British patrol in Mosul. This is a very common operation. They're moving probably about 100 kilometers an hour because in Iraq, speed is your ally, and if you're going too slow, you're courting death. The problem is whether you're going fast or slow, there's no technology available really to readily discern where the next improvised explosive device is. So if you could hear them beyond the volume that was in play there in their British accents, what they were doing is trying to mentally, and then verbalizing this, check off the relative threat represented by each vehicle as they passed it. It doesn't really make any difference because by the time you've uttered those words, you're there and the decision is made for you. In this case, there was a command-detonated VBIED, a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device, beside the roadway. There were four, four uh, deaths in this particular attack, and it was followed by a machine gun assault, as you heard, by insurgents who were concealed in the immediate vicinity because they then attacked the disabled vehicles. What we learned from this attack was that if we had a rear vehicle that stayed staggered a bit back of the main convoy, we could use them to then push the disabled vehicles out of the immediate kill zone and try to recover the wounded and get them triaged and medevaced out of there. And the enemy, being a very savvy and, and cunning foe, then adjusted, and what they routinely did after that was they set two kill zones a primary and a secondary. So when you pushed into what you thought was a place of safety, what you really had done was push into a secondary kill zone that they controlled as well. Next slide, please. Uh, make, make no mistake about it, even when you're operating in armored vehicles, these are all level six armored uh, Chevrolet Suburbans. I spent my life in these for 14 months. Uh, you take significant damage if you encounter a roadside IED. We hit an IED in Kirkuk that rocked our convoy back and forth, shattered our windows, penetrated uh, the outer shell of the vehicles. Uh, an angel of God sat on my shoulder and we pushed through it. We were not attacked a second time. We managed to get back to Baghdad. But make no mistake about it, even moving in armored vehicles uh, represent an enormous risk. Next, please. Next. 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 And most at risk in the Suburbans we drove were the rear gunners. These were typically South African, former members of the South African Defense Force or South African National Police, most of whom came to Iraq and at the height of the war there were 7,000 South Africans there as contract security personnel. And whatever your political persuasion may be about South Africa and the change of government and all of that, and all of these folks came post-apartheid era to Iraq to make money, frankly, to uh, feed their families. They served us loyally, and I, when people ask me to describe the South Africans who protected me and us, I say they were loyal, dedicated, dignified, and they were lethal. And I pay them particular tribute because in the, in the course of the 14 months I was there, eight of them were killed in the course of defending either protecting me or those with whom I was uh, moving. The rear seat which was a machine gunner seat, was always the most risky. It had the least protection, and this is where the most significant amount of deaths normally occurred, either from enemy fire, shrapnel, or frankly from incineration after the vehicle was struck with a bomb and then become, became engulfed in flame. Next, please. Next. 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 
Next. Next. Next. Next. We moved in what we call six vehicle packages, only during daylight, tried never to move during times of darkness. You tried to vary your time and your movement, but obviously you have to get from point X to point Y. There's only so many alternatives you can take. I'll tell you a story that uh, this is another one of those kind of points of inspiration. The first convoy I moved in was actually coming from the Baghdad International Airport into Baghdad after I had landed there which was a whole other experience. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just take a segue here for a minute and, and see if I can lighten things. Let me tell you, I'm sure as Jerry will remember, what it was like to fly in or out of Baghdad. They don't do this normally. Of course, nothing in Baghdad was normal. You cruise in Kuwait City or from Amman, and you're kind of lulled into the sense of, well, this is a pretty normal flight. This isn't bad, until you get to the 10,000-foot marker about 12 miles out from Baghdad. And then they go into a corkscrew maneuver. It literally is like this, in an effort to reduce the footprint for a possible surface-to-air missile attack. Well, first of all, if you're riding primarily with people who are Arabic speakers, the announcement they make is in English. So none of the Arab speakers understand what's happening. My first flight into Baghdad, it was me, another State Department guy, and 198 of my closest Arab friends, none of whom spoke English. So I heard the announcement, my friend heard the announcement, to my 198 Iraqi companions, they just heard some garbled speech by the pilot, and then came the corkscrew. And this enormous wail starts in the cabin of the aircraft. There are prayers being offered up to God knows what deities, and I have no idea what's going to happen. All I know is that if this happens, there's only two of us, and there's 198 of them. And that was my kind of introduction to landing in Baghdad. When we made our first convoy into the city, which is the point I was about to begin, the convoy commander comes out and greets me. Now, Mar now, mind you, I've traveled 30 hours to get to Baghdad. I'm expecting at least maybe a three-minute, boy, are we glad to see you. We got some quality accommodations set up for you. We got some hot chow. We're good to go. I got about a 12-second cursory, glad to see you made it. Let me tell you how this equipment's going to work. Here's your machine gun. Put on this vest. This is the route we're going to take. This is what we're going to do when we get attacked. Not if we get attacked, but when we get attacked. You talk about sweeping aside your sense of being a tourist in a country. It happens just like that. This is on what you might have known as and heard on the news as the most dangerous five and a half kilometers of highway in the world, coming from the Baghdad International Airport into Baghdad. The convoy commander is one of these extraordinarily gifted South Africans whom I met. He loaded me aboard. We get ready to go. He, he briefs the convoy team. Thank you. He briefs the convoy team, and he says, nobody dies today. That's the opening to the briefing. Well, on top of 36 hours of flight, a corkscrew arrival, and no more than a 12-second 12, a 12 greeting, I have to tell you, that, that phrase, nobody dies today, sets you back on your heels. When we got into the city, his name was Damien. I said, Damien, what is that about? He said, the last convoy we went out on, we got ambushed. We expended 1,200 rounds fighting our way from the airport to downtown. And we may have lost somebody then, but we're not going to lose anybody again when I'm running the convoys. And I came to know this man, and he was a warrior through and through. And I said, what brings you to Iraq? He said, I'm a pastor of a church in a small city in South Africa, and we don't have the money to, to build a new sanctuary. So I'm here to make that money and go back and build a house for my congregation. So you think about trying to juxtapose his emotions and his reason for being there with this expression, nobody dies today. And it gives you kind of a sense of how complicated things were there. Next, please. Next. 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 This is another example of a common vehicle discovered, frankly uh, and gratefully, before it was detonated. Next. Here you see where the wiring detonation core was run actually to the turn signal. Next. And the back seat once again removed for the placement of an improvised explosive device.